Injuries abound. The new look Lynch look scary. Lucas Seehofer, an expert on both here to talk all about it. Locked on women's basketball starts now. You are Locked On Women's Basketball, your daily podcast on women's basketball. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. A very happy Wednesday to you and welcome to Locked On Women's Basketball. I am host Howard McDowell and I want to thank you for making us your first listen every day. You guys keep showing up for us the way we show up for you. Over 200,000 of you listening in April alone. I got to check the charts, but we are on track to break that here in May. Make sure you subscribe on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. And of course, it is not just me. It is the incredible team across the board over at The Next, thenexthoops.com, where we have over 100 reported pieces about women's basketball, past, present, and future. Thenexthoops.com, it's $9 a month, $72 a year. It all gets sent to your inbox What could be better than that? It is the women's basketball newsroom we have always waited for. Wait no longer, friends. It is here. And a big part of what we do in multiple ways, a super utility player, um, I'm going to say Luisa Rise, but maybe that's a sore subject, Uh, Lucas Seehofer. At the moment, uh, he joins us to talk uh, about uh, the WNBA injuries. Uh, He's done something invaluable which is build a WNBA injury tracker. So we have the data to understand. We're going to talk about that in segment one, what we see, what we're not seeing, maybe more important, uh, and what we need to find out about that. Segments two and three, we are talking about the Minnesota Lynx, who are off to a flying start and real interesting. So we'll get to that. But Lucas, just to begin with, the injury news, I guess the top line is so far, It's not good. Take us through sort of the biggest early season trends that we're seeing uh, in terms of health across the league. Yeah. So, uh, you know, entering, well, I guess after last night, we're now up to 41 injuries or illnesses that have already uh, occurred uh, that have caused games to be missed already this season. Now, some of those have uh, occurred in the preseason or, you know, during the offseason when players were playing overseas, but they caused uh, games to be missed here at the beginning of the season. Um, so that, that 41 number um, is uh, is higher than what we saw at this time last year. So through the first two weeks of the season last year, uh, we were at uh, 25 injuries um, or, or illnesses that had occurred. Um, and last season we ended up seeing, at least to my knowledge, um, the most injuries and the most games missed due to injury um, over the course of a single WNBA season. So right now we're uh, we're, we're kind of tracking to to be higher um, than uh, what we were last year, which is um, concerning. It is concerning. And I guess, you know, part of it is when you look at last season as the most games that we've ever seen played in a WNBA season, are we talking about something? And I went to school for literature, not for math. So take me through it. Are we talking about something that on a per game basis is happening in a more significant way? Or can some of this be explained by the fact that it's an expanded season footprint? Yeah. So and, and that's kind of the million dollar question. I think I think the part of the answer is, uh, yes, it's probably just uh, a component of it is there are more games, there are more opportunities to get hurt, so therefore there are going to be more injuries. Um, the the other thing that that's kind of difficult to, to to look at here is when we look at this from a scientific uh, standpoint, uh, we have to do you know statistical analyses, and one of the ways that we do that to determine if a change is like legitimate or if it's just caused by chance uh, mm-hmm. is is uh, to to determine what's called statistical significance. Wow. Um, right now, our um, data, when we look at this from like a injury per day in the month uh, standpoint, um, right now we're looking at about 2.3 injuries per day in the month of May uh, mm-hmm. this season, whereas last year it was 2. Point, uh, I think it was 2.0 right on the dot. So that's a basically a 15% increase over the course of, of the month. Now this year there were, there were more games played in the month of May. Uh, just because the the schedule is is a little different because of the uh, Olympics coming on and it's kind of more condensed. Um, that being said, uh, that change, that 15% change, doesn't approach statistical significance. Um, so we we're we're at that point where it's kind of like, 
you know, is it, it's the numbers are higher, but are they is are they higher because of chance or are they legitimately higher? And right now we just don't really have the the, the volume of data to make that determination. You know, we might, <clears throat> you know, ten years down the line, we might come back to this say and say, okay, yeah, the injuries that occurred within the first two weeks of the twenty twenty four WNBA season, that was a real legitimate problem. Um, but right now it just kind of in the heat of the moment, it, it's difficult to determine. But anytime you see a you know, a 15% increase if you look at it in terms of injuries per day, or I think it's approaching a 60% difference when you look at it in terms of um, total injuries that have uh, that have occurred. Mm -hmm. um, it, it may not raise red flags, but it should at least raise yellow flags. And so let's talk about that. And um, before we do, because those are two critical questions, is how big does it have to be to matter? And um, in a statistical significant uh way a statistically significant way and also how far out how far into the season we need to get before we get there um but before we get to that point i just want our listeners to understand we're just just a, a brief you know and sort of in the way you would uh an expert witness testimony just so people understand your background where you're coming from for this information yeah so i'm a uh physical therapist uh by, by education i'm also a full-time professor um, at a small uh, D3 uh, college in southern Minnesota. Um, and then I am also uh, working on a PhD uh, in kinesiology. And this is actually kind of my my, my uh, dissertation project is, is this tracking of injuries in the WNBA. Yeah. So not coming to this from a layman's perspective, I think it's important for people to establish that as well. But so let's go back to it for a moment. Is there a number you say, all right, 15% is not statistically significant at this point. We're relatively new into the season we are 15 days into the season as of this right and would there be let's say it was a hundred percent would that be at this point something we'd say well that is statistically significant yeah so when we have part of this is also because um you know we don't have data from from the WNBA league itself which is a whole another can of worms that we can open if you want to right. um but um basically what we're looking at is we're looking at the injuries that occurred last year and the injuries that occurred so far this year that's basically the only you know certified data that we have on the books right now um so when you do that when there's such little volume of data uh you have to use what's called a z score and a z score basically looks at the standard deviations like are the amount of injuries in a given time frame um two standard deviations above what we would expect mm -hmm. um and in order to reach that level for for this month of may we would have to hit 70 injuries in order for us to say, yep, that's not due to chance. That's a, that's a legitimate problem. Um, so unless something, you know, terrifying happens in the next <laughs> two or three days, uh, we're, we're not going to reach, you know, we're not going to have 29 more injuries in the next two or three days. So, um, but uh, as we add more months to the calendar and as we add more seasons to the database, um, then we'll be able to use different uh, kind of more nuanced statistical analyses, um, which, which may then at that point determine, okay, yeah, we didn't think it was statistically significant at the time, but now with more data uh, and a larger database, now we can say, uh, nope, that was actually statistically significant. So part of this is we won't know until, we may not know until years down the line. Well, so, but that's the other part of it. And before we get into our first break, just the league has an obligation, as I understand in the CBA, to provide this data, number one. Um, how, how transparent have they been about it? And number two, how valuable would that be not just for the league, but for the well-being of the players to do so? Yeah, absolutely. You know, when I, I've reached out to the league multiple times, both in the both in the sense of a, of a researcher um, and in the in the sense of a journalist, and have uh, not gotten a whole lot of response back from the league. Um, but the, the you know the benefit of having something like this um, is that now we can say, okay, these are because right now basically what we're doing is we're going off of what we see during game action and what we get from the uh, injury reports. Right. So if the injury report just says ankle, that's all we know. We don't know what specifically occurred at the ankle <laughs> to cause the injury. We don't know if it's a sprain, we don't know if it's a fracture, we don't, you know, that kind you're, of stuff. You're telling me lower leg injury is not a useful bit of information from a Right, 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 exactly. We, we don't wanna go hockey with this where everything's an upper body injury or a lower body injury. Um, <laughs> Can I just well, ask, shouldn't the WNBPA be involved in this too? I mean, this is something about the well-being for players. Yes, absolutely. Players? Absolutely. Because then if we have that specific data, then we can go back and say like, oh, uh, player X. And, and a lot of this is when we approach the league, I say, hey, 
you know, the, 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 in the CBA, it says this data is, is anonymous. Right. Um, and that's ultimately all we need. Cause we can say, okay, if you had a ankle sprain and it caused you to miss X amount of games, uh, we can, with enough data potentially say, okay, that puts you at X percent of a risk to develop a knee injury or, or something else. So then you can develop training programs to basically build up the strength of your legs so that we maybe can cut down on that risk of developing a, a further injury in, in the future or preventing an injury altogether. Well, um, to that point, I, I just, I am hopeful that there's more transparency uh, because once again, it's one of these examples where it is good for everyone. Got to get to a break, but I want to get back to you about it. You're doing really important work here. And I'm really glad you have the WNBA injury tracker. Segment two, we're going to be talking about a team that's weathering a particular injury right now in Diamond Miller, but uh, doing it well so far. Back right after this with Lucas Seehofer. I'm Howard Magdal. You're listening to Locked On Women's Basketball. Locked On Women's Basketball is brought to you by Game Time. And listen, Lucas, we've talked about sort of the injury risk and everything that goes into that. The injury risk uh, to my emotional well-being, if I don't get the right tickets for the uh, the women who live in my house, my my daughters, um, is very, very significant. Um, you know, my, my wife and I, we have a much more collaborative uh, outlook when it comes to that. But if I don't get the right view for Juliet, especially my basketball uh, crazed, younger daughter uh it's it's a problem right i, I do you have any research on that <laughs> yeah no uh, uh you know just anecdotal research uh, anecdotal and, research. Uh, and <laughs> no, which, which is very helpful and appreciated. And I'm, again, providing you full transparency here. And that's where game time comes in, speaking of that full transparency, because game time gives you the opportunity not just to buy tickets with prices that go down as you get closer to the game and you see those last minute deals as well. You can save up to 60 percent off doing that along with the flash deals. But my favorite part is the seat view. You get a panoramic view from your seat in the app before you buy just an incredible thing so how do you do it download the game time app create an account and use code locked on nba for twenty dollars off your first purchase twenty dollars off your first purchase just to be clear about that in terms do apply again create an account redeem code l-o-c-k-e-d-o-n nba for twenty dollars off your first purchase download game time today Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Make your children happy. Locked on women's basketball is also brought to you by Miracle Made Sheets. And friends, you might not, not understand why does he have so much energy here? It's a Wednesday morning, it's the middle of the work week. Well, let me tell you why. It's because of the Miracle made sheets inspired by nasa miracle made uses silver infused fabrics and makes temperature regulating bedding so you can sleep at the perfect temperature all night long lucas again we're talking anecdotally here but don't i seem like i'm in a better mood the last few weeks like i have more energy for everything i've never seen you more chipper <laughs> you may be the first person who's called me chipper but i <laughs> But it's true. We, we got these miracle made sheets and I love them. My wife absolutely loves them. How they feel. I've heard great things from our hosts across the network. How do you get them yourself? Go to trymiracle.com slash locked on. Again, that is trymiracle.com slash L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N to try miracle made sheets today. And now there's a special deal. If you use our promo Locked on at checkout, you'll get fr three free towels and save an extra 20%. Now, remember, Miracle Sheets, they're so confident in their product. It is backed with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you aren't 100% satisfied, you'll get a full refund. So try miracle.com slash locked on and use the code locked on to claim your free three-piece towel set and save over 40%. Thank you to Miracle Made for sponsoring this episode. Thank you to Miracle Made for making me chipper. 
back here in segment two with Lucas Seehofer, who's often chipper as well, I would say. And someone else who's chipper right now these days, Cheryl Reeve. Again, not a not a word you normally associate with Cheryl, right? But this Minnesota Lynch team off to a four and one start, best defensive team in the WNBA entering Wednesday night's games. But Lucas, you notice something on the offensive end, top line that dovetails with what Cheryl said was a point of emphasis coming into the season. Take me through what you found. Yeah. So Cheryl Reeve, you know, in the uh, preseason, uh, during the off season, really mentioned, you know, during our, during her press uh, availabilities that one of the focuses that she really wanted to have coming into the season uh, was, was shooting more threes, basically being more dangerous from, from beyond the arc. Um, part of that was just because of, you know, that's the way the league is kind of going. Um, but part of that was also just, you know, offense just wasn't up to snuff um, over the last couple of seasons. Um, so, uh, basically, uh, plan, get more three-point shooters, has been executed wonderfully because uh, not only are the Lynx one of the best defensive teams in the league, but they also lead the league in effective field goal percentage and true shooting percentage. Um, and I believe they're second uh, in the league in three-point percentage. So um, basically, if the plan was to get better three-point shooters, I would say uh, mission accomplished. They have, and they've done it with a lot of new players. But what we've also seen, once again, is in a lot of ways, it's – point guard by committee. It does seem like even among those playmakers, Courtney Williams is first among them. What have you seen out of her early on and how much does she dovetail with the expectations set at the position that in a lot of ways, and we've talked about this, it's been a bit of a revolving door since Lindsey Whalen's exit. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think that was one of the things that kind of held the team back over the last couple of years was just inconsistent point guard play. And, you know, they, you had moments of, of things looking great um, and then moments of things just being like, no, this is this is not just the way forward. Um, so one of the, the things that Reeve has also mentioned is that she wants Courtney Williams to be, um, you know, the expectation was the one they brought her in that she was going to be the point guard uh, on the team. Um, and that's not, you know, maybe her her normal traditional position is being a, a pure point guard. Uh, but within this Lynx offense, it is, it has been, um, you know, I would say nothing short of a godsend, you know, just an ability to be consistently handle the ball, make the right plays. You know, it doesn't have to be flashy, um, but to just be consistent uh, in your effort uh, and, and in your ability to impact the, the game um, has been invaluable uh, for, for the Lynx up to this point. And, and part of that too is, is coming from uh, Natisha Heidemann coming off the bench, um, being able to, um, you know, provide that solid backup where when Williams is off the court, having somebody else that can come in and still, you know, maintain the flow of the offense, maintain uh, control of the ball um, has been, has been huge. Kayla McBride somehow is reverse aging. And I'm not quite sure how she's doing that, but you talked about effective field goal percentage and she is at 70.4% early on. Now, again, I don't necessarily expect that number to carry forward, but what we are seeing is an offense in which Kayla seems to be getting better looks. So just kind of take me through what you're seeing out of KMAC. And, you know, again, it's hard not to look at that signing within the framework of the modern free agent era as one of the best, if not the best in league history to date. Yeah. So part of uh, having inconsistent point guard play in the past is that a lot of that ball handling duty uh, was then shifted off to uh, Kayla. And that's not necessarily her strong shoot. You know, she's a, she, I would say she's a, a prototypical two guard. Mm-hmm. Um, so this season, she's basically been able to just focus on being a two guard. Um, and her, you know, absurd numbers have kind of been bolstered by the last game where she didn't miss until her like last two shots of the game, uh, <laughs> which are which was just insane to watch. Um, but just being able to have her focus on being the two uh, and providing offense at the two, um, again, it, it just made the flow of the offense uh, so much better. Um, and that goes back to what we were just talking about about having someone with with Courtney Williams' ability to just be consistent uh, has really unlocked this uh, this Lynx offense. Obviously, we can't talk about this team without talking about Nafisa Collier. Um, we're going to get to a second break, but on the other side of it, I want to talk about the idea of Nafisa Collier as an MVP candidate and, again, how far she and this Lynch team can go. So back shortly with Lucas Seehofer, I'm Howard Magdal. You're listening to Locked On Women's Basketball.
So back here in segment three with Lucas Seahoff, we're talking Minnesota Lynch. And I know it's their one loss this year, but I think maybe the best game I've seen so far was not just the way Minnesota and Connecticut battled to the end of Connecticut, of course, being undefeated 6-0 and so far. And for all of the conversation about the Aces and the Liberty as the clear top two teams, you have to have this conversation. The top four is wide open, and I mean that one through four, not just three and four, the way I thought of it prior to the season, is that game that went into overtime between Minnesota and Connecticut, ultimately Connecticut prevails 83-82 in OT on the road. That felt like a statement game to me for Minnesota as this Lynch team is among the elite, but no more so than Nafisa Collier. To go into Connecticut, to be guarded by Alyssa Thomas, and to put up a 30 spot, that struck me as one of those signature plant MVP performances early on. Do you see it that way? And just like generally speaking, what is Fee doing even better this year? Because her numbers have taken another step forward. Yeah, no, I, I think, you know, Fee up to this point in the season, again, it's early, but she's got to be at least, if not among the candidates, uh, the early season candidates for MVP, you know, maybe potentially even the favorite. I mean, she's just been playing out of her mind. Um, like when you look at um, like her overall stats, you know, one of the stats that I look at when I, when I, try to determine, okay, what is this player's individual impact on the game is, is plus minus. Mm -hmm. um, and at this stage of the game where everybody's played different, you know, amounts of games, you can't look at the raw number. You have to look at the, the average. Uh, and right now Collier is number uh, three in the league in plus minus um, at 13.2. At uh, interestingly, Kayla McBride, number one, 13.8. Right. Uh, so, uh, but if you look at like what she's doing, you know, she's, she's averaging, uh, 23 points a game, which if I just do a quick file here is fourth in the league. Uh, if you look at her rebound, she's averaging 10.4 rebounds, which is also fourth in the league. Um, and she's, she's the anchor, um, of, of one of the league's best defenses right now. You know, the links are really good this season so far at getting steals. Um, and, and she's kind of, uh, one of the, one of the anchors behind that. Um, She's at 3.9%. She leads the team in steal percentage. That, that's the number you that a, a guard normally gets, you know, getting into passing lanes and picking off uh, uh, errant passes. Exactly. So she's she's not only, you know, we've seen it from her in the in the past of, of having, you know, instances of, of, of greatness. And she's obviously been one of the better talents in the league since she entered. Uh, but again, going back to, you know, uh, positional uh, variance in the past, she's kind of split time between the three and the four. Um, I've personally always kind of thought that she, she's been the best when she was just focused on the four. Mm -hmm. um, and again, this season, that's what she's been able to do. Um, and it's just uh, uh, unlocked a whole nother level. It's been really impressive. You know, again, the jump for me is that last year there was clearly a three-person race for MVP in the minds of most people, which is to say Brianna Stewart, Alyssa Thomas, Asia Wilson, to the point that Asia Wilson getting a single fourth place vote has somehow been this deeply insulting thing in a lot of people's eyes. And the thing I just keep coming back to is Nafisa Collier was damn good last year. Nafisa Collier, who finished fourth in the MVP voting. And like clearly there's a huge gap, a huge drop. They were one, two, three. They were bunched up. No first place votes for Nafisa Collier. And, and to be fair, I did not vote for her first place, but I did have her fourth. And it would not have been crazy in my mind to have other people rate her even higher than that. Well, now we're talking about a moment where she absolutely maybe should have been, but absolutely has to be in that conversation for best player in the WNBA. And it just goes back to there's a whole other series of conversations to be had about the fact that having somebody on your all WNBA first team is not an insult. That is an extremely high honor in this league where there is so much talent. But if Nafisa Collier is not in your MVP conversation early on, I don't know what that conversation is other than incomplete. So again, let's go back. Nafisa Collier was the sixth overall pick in the draft. She was selected. Kayla McBride was signed. And in both of these instances, the idea is, well, Connecticut's getting some, or excuse me, Minnesota's getting some good players, but they aren't necessarily top options in the view of many. Pretty clearly, 
Minnesota so far has a one-two punch here that can get them far. How far do you think they can go? Yeah, and, and to your point, you know, uh, another thing that that uh, Reeve really put emphasis on um, this offseason was bringing in uh, performance staff to basically help the team uh, improve even more. Um, that, that was something that they had mentioned to me uh, previously. It was about how, like, they didn't necessarily feel like they were falling behind, but they felt like they could progress it a little bit more. So they went and they brought in three new performance coaches and health coaches. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, the, the dividends are just off the chart right now. But as far as how far can this team go, I think, you know, what they've shown right now, if they keep up this level of play all season long, um, they're going to be right up there with, uh, with the Sun, the Liberty and, and the Aces in terms of title favorites. Um, I think what we'll see tonight, you know, like you said, that 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 one point overtime loss, the, the lone undefeated team in this uh, in the year so far, was kind of a, uh, the, a I would say a first barometer of okay, what what is this team all about? We're going to get a second barometer, not to not to date this this uh, uh, this episode too much, but we're going to get another barometer uh, Wednesday night uh, when they play the Aces. And I think if they go out and they play to the level that they're capable of playing, they beat the Aces. Now we have to have a okay, where is this Lynx? Team among the top four it is a game i am extremely excited to see uh you're seeing nafisa collier against asia wilson um what what national network is that going to be on tonight i believe that's going to be on uh on the national network actually just kidding i don't believe it is right it, it's, it's, my understanding it is that it's lead pass only yeah there yeah is. no it's uh well actually it's on it's on NBA TV, which is national yeah. television. Enough, well, that, you know what? That counts. I'll give them that. Good. I'm glad it's on NBA TV. And while I will be physically at uh, Mercury versus Liberty, the thing I've been doing uh, on press row is having a second game playing at the same time that allows me to keep track of everything. Nafisa Collier versus Asia Wilson, that alone is going to be worth the price of admission. Well, Lucas Seehofer, I am so delighted to chat with you. Again, grateful for the work you are doing on the injury front, which is ultimately going to make this a healthier and a better league for everyone involved. So keep up that work. We will continue to publish it at the next, every opportunity we can to make sure we shine a light on it and continue doing the good work to uh, making people healthier Enjoy your lynch as well. And again, sorry to mention uh, Louisa Rise up top. So until tomorrow, when we get a massive upgrade in the host chair, because Gigi Spear will be joining you tomorrow. I am Howard Megdahl, thanking you for making us your first listen every day. Like, subscribe, wherever you get your podcasts. See you tomorrow. Have a wonderful Wednesday. You are Locked On Women's Basketball, your daily podcast on women's basketball. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.